Hello and welcome to today's FCICA webinar. My name is Angela, I'm with Freestone and I'll be producing today's event. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. We'll be answering your questions at the end of the presentation today. We encourage you to type and submit your questions during the presentation. To do so, click on the Q&A tab at the bottom left of your webinar window. Click the submit button to send in your question. If you need assistance at any time, click on the help tab for our support team's contact information. Great, I think we're ready to begin. Now I'd like to throw the floor to Christine with FCICA to begin today's presentation. Hello and welcome to the FCICA webinar series. Thank you for joining us. This webinar will be recorded. The recorded session will be housed on the FCICA Member Center and this educational portal. Mark your calendars for these upcoming webinars. Thursday, May 6th, Stop Concrete Moisture, presented by David Seeland, Principal and Founder, ISE Logic. On Thursday, May 13, join us for Millican Solutions for the Flooring Industry, presented by Russell Cleveland, North American Quality Director, Floor Covering Division for Millican and Company. And be sure to register for the May virtual meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday, May 25th and 26th. Two full days of educational and associate presentations, keynote speakers, and networking. Registration is free for all attendees. Visit FCICA.com to view and register for the event and these future webinars. FCICA has recently updated the safety book, Start With Safety. It is available electronically free to members and printed versions are available for $185. The safety book is an essential item to have in your office and on every job site. Purchase it on FCICA's website today. Thank you for joining us for Thick Poor Gypsum Underlayment, the what, why, where, and how, and its preparation for finished flooring. We are pleased to introduce our presenter, Seth Pavarnik, Director of Technical Service, Artix Americas. Seth Pavarnik, has worked for Artix Americas in the Technical Service Department since 1991. He has led the Artix Academy training program for substrate preparation, moisture control, self-leveling underlayments, and patching compounds, tile and stone installation systems, engineered concrete repair systems, and designer floor polish systems. He has presented information on moisture in concrete, substrate preparation, flooring adhesives, and tile and stone to many industry groups. Seth is active in several industry associations and standard associate organizations and currently serves as the IICRC Vice Chair for the ISSI excuse me, certification. Seth sits on the Board of Directors for FCICA and serves on the Education Committee. Welcome, Seth. We're excited to have you. I'm going to turn the controls over to you. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, Angelie. Uh, as Christine said, my name is Seth Pavarnik. I'm the Director of Technical Services for Ardex Americas. I would like to thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you taking a little time out of your schedule uh, to spend some time with us talking about thick, poor gypsum underlayment. Uh, we'll look at the why, uh, the what, the why, the where, how, and its preparation uh, for finished flooring. You know, a little bit more specifically, you know, we're going to look at what is gypsum, so we have an understanding there. Uh, we'll take a look at why it's used. Uh, we'll look at where it's used, um, its physical application, uh, pumping uh, this material. We'll look at ultimately its physical properties, and then when it's all said and done and the product has been poured, we'll kind of review some things to look for uh, to include uh, preparation for flooring, you know, patching and leveling materials over the thick pore gypsum. So we're going to start actually with a polling question. And I'll have Angeli um, send out the first poll. The question uh, to everybody is, what is the chemical name for gypsum?
Angela, should we give it a few more seconds? I think that's probably good. Okay, so um, question, what is the chemical name for gypsum? We had uh, three people, or 33% said calcium silicate. Uh, nobody answered calcium aluminate. Um, 10 or 11% answered calcium sulfate. And uh, the majority answered calcium silicate hydrate. So the correct answer is calcium sulfate. So anytime you would see that on an SDS, that's referring to what we know as gypsum. So looking at this next slide here, it, it's a very technical slide. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but, um, but, but gypsum is a highly engineered material. Um, there's some different natural gypsums out there. There's calcium sulfate dihydrate. Uh, there's calcium sulfate anhydrate. And uh, natural gypsums are found in the earth, uh, typically next to limestone. And sometimes they'll, uh, they'll, they'll take these natural gypsums, uh, namely the, the anhydrite, and they will add a half a water molecule to it um, in an autoclave um, under you know, severe you know, pressure, temperature, and humidity to, to create what they call uh, calcium uh, sulfate semihydrate. Um, of the natural gypsums, uh, those are the three types that we see out there in the industry. Uh, but there's also synthetic gypsum. And when you manufacture hydrofluoric acid, uh, one of the byproducts of that is, is calcium sulfate anhydrite. Uh, that's a synthetic gypsum. And uh, burning of, of coal in the, in the power plants, uh, one of the byproducts of burning coal in the flues uh, when they go through the desulfurization process re results in uh, calcium sulfate anhydrite. Um, so, you know, something you may hear synthetic gypsum out there as well, as opposed to natural. And um, there is natural that comes from the earth, and then you have synthetic that uh, comes from different plants, as noted here. Gypsum gets a bad rap. Um, in, in a lot of cases, you know, you know, many people don't have a real... Uh, positive uh, experience with gypsum in general, and, and there, there's some reasons behind that. Uh, in some cases, you know, where 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 it is used, um, you know, could be used on grade or below grade where it shouldn't have been, uh, and there was issues there. Um, could have been how it was used. You know, maybe it was used in an application that had heavy rolling loads, um, um, in applications that it wasn't really designed for. But a majority of the issues we see out there can, can tend to be how it was mixed. Um, you know, too much water into the mix. Uh, we see that with all leveling products, uh, too much water in the mix. Uh, you're going to see when, uh, if, you, if you're unaware of how, how gypsum is actually poured, uh, you get bag gypsum with sand uh, and water, uh, and that gets mixed uh, together in a pump, and sometimes too much sand gets you know, placed in the mix as well. Um, some of the reasons why it gets a bad rap, but the thing that I want everybody to understand, um, gypsum is really a highly engineered material. Um, not all gypsums have, uh, not all gypsums are the same. Um, some of them have different properties. You can have fast setting gypsums, moderate setting gypsums, short working time gypsums, you know, long working time, high early strength and high ultimate strength. And there are some gypsums that are more suited for, for bag products. Uh, highly engineered material, which leads me to our second polling question. And the second polling question here is, um, what chemical is not found in Portland cement? Uh, the answer is you have uh, dicalcium silicate, and we have tetracalcium alumina ferret, we have calcium sulfate, and calcium hydroxide. So what chemical do you think is not found in Portland cement?
Still got some answers coming in. All right, so we got the uh, majority of us have answered uh, this question here. So nobody chose uh, dicalcium silicate. Uh, we have uh, about 27% uh, selected tetracalcium alumina ferret. We have 45% selected the calcium sulfate and 27% selected calcium hydroxide. Um, I will tell you that was a trick question. Not that I expected anybody to know that, but we did talk about gypsum being, uh, his chemical name being calcium sulfate. And I figured that most people would uh, uh, state that calcium sulfate is not in Portland cement. That would be the, the logical uh, deduction. Um, but the reality is um, there is uh, calcium sulfate. There is gypsum in Portland cement, uh, just a little bit of it. And it is in there to regulate set. Um, there's, you know, four main chemicals in Portland cement, um, and the uh, gypsum uh, in there helps regulate the cement. So we have a con regulate the set of that Portland cement when it reacts with water. And with the hydraulic cements out there, um, you know, the patching and leveling materials out there, there's gypsum that's a part of their uh, those technologies. Uh, some are based on gypsum, but others that aren't based on gypsum may have gypsum in there as a part of the chemistry. You know, it's it's in there originally as calcium sulfate, but it's a part of the chemistry so that when the reaction happens, it's no longer, uh, you know, calcium sulfate as we know it. It changes into whatever it changes to. So just a little bit of information, a little bit of trivia there. Um, let's take a look at um, why gypsum is used, uh, gypsum, uh, thick pore gypsum underlayment, why it's used. Um, one of the reasons why is uh, fire rated assemblies. Um, if you look at the, the diagram here, this is a one hour assembly and it is um, when you test assemblies that you have to test a, a, a complete assembly. You don't test the specific product. So, you know, in this specific one hour assembly, you know, it consists of a subfloor that's five eighths plywood over floor joists that are 16 inches on center. Um, you have a ceiling assembly here, which is a couple layers of drywall and you have three quarters of an inch of of gypsum and, and that complete assembly with the gypsum uh, uh, achieves a, a one hour one hour floor um, floor assembly and you know it's testing that's completed by you know underwriter uh, laboratories uh, it's UL testing uh, what's one of the main reasons that uh, the thick pore gypsum underlayments are used another reason they're used out there is acoustic and thermal installation insulation uh, you have a uh, uh, an insulation membrane or a sound reduction membrane, and you have thick pour uh, gypsum that's poured over top of them, uh, the, over top of the membrane. Uh, pretty uh, common reason why the thick pour gypsum is used. I uh, showed you a picture here of a, a sound membrane here, but uh, yet there's a nail being driven up through the subfloor, and um, not a good thing. We've got to get rid of that nail. That nail is going to transmit sound to the, the area below. Uh, the third reason why thick pore gypsum is commonly used is uh, in-floor heating. Uh, as you see in the picture there, we have hydronic heating. We have heating tubes there, water flowing through the heating tubes, um, you know, and it's common to uh, pour the thick pore gypsum over the hydronic heating tubes. So those are three common reasons why they're used. Uh, a lot of the general contractors end up using, um, you know, the gyps thick pore gypsum underlayments because it's uh, relatively cost effective from a pricing standpoint, uh, more inexpensive. Let's take a look at where it is used. Okay, now the, the statistics here are, are pretty common. Uh, they, they may vary depending on where you're from, but generally speaking, um, you know, these are pretty accurate statistics. Uh, the thick pore gypsum is very commonly used in multi-story, multi-family uh, housing, uh, as you see in the top picture there. That's about 70% uh, of the installations that are conducted. Uh, it's a wooden subfloor uh, where they're pouring uh, the gypsum over the entire floor. Uh, you know, commonly uh, might be a part of a sound system and uh, you know, fire rated system. 
Uh, some other applications might be hotels or similar where we have precast plank installed and there's camber issues between the plank, meaning that the plank don't meet up, up uh, perfectly with each other. You'll uh, have thick board gypsum that's poured there. And, you know, maybe another 10% is uh, commercial construction over concrete. All right, another polling question here. So what grade level should thick pour gypsum underlayment be used? Your answers are above grade, on grade, below grade, and all grades. All right, so it looks like a majority of uh, everybody answered, 75% um, answered uh, an above grade application and 25% uh, uh, in an all grade uh, application answer. Um, very commonly, uh, thick pore gypsum underlayment should be used above grade applications, generally speaking. However, um, always check with manufacturer's recommendations as to where they're suitable uh, for use. But generally speaking, above grade. Let's take a look at um, the application of thick pour gypsum, uh, specifically pumping. Um, so gypsum is a bag product. Um, and we're gonna kind of take a look at things from um, a consistency standpoint uh, and look at the, the variables uh, uh, out there. So a consistent product can be supplied and is supplied from the manufacturer. Uh, and that's just the gypsum. So what's very common uh, on these applications, you have basically have a truckload of sand that's you know dumped out onto the, the parking deck and there's a pump that will actually pump the materials up to the multiple floors. Um, that sand that's used, um, the, the grade of the sand is, is gonna vary. Uh, that could be a variable, you know, depending on uh, you know, where, you know, what part of the country, uh, what part of the world uh, this materials are being poured. Um, the dryness of the sand or the wetness of the sand, however you want to look at it, that's also a variable. You know, we could, in theory, get dry sand. It's dumped out on the parking lot today, but a rainstorm comes and we have wet sand. Uh, and those are things that have to be taken into consideration uh, when pumping the, the gypsum. So basically what happens here is there's a pump hopper and, you know, the, the right amount of water is to be placed into the pump hopper, pump hopper and uh, the gypsum is added to that pump hopper. And then the sand is very commonly uh, scooped up with a front end loader, a little bobcat like you see in the picture. And that's placed into the hopper where um, all, all materials are mixed together. Uh, dropped into another hopper where there's a large, you know, rotor stator, uh, metal rotor onto a, uh, inside a, a rubber line jacket uh, driven by a motor. And that will turn and create pressure and push the material through a hose and up multiple floors. Um, you know, it's very common that uh, you, might, you might do a four to one mix, meaning four bags of, of gypsum and uh, one scoop of uh, sand uh, these front end loader scoops or they have calibrated scoops uh, to give the, the right amount of sand provided they scoop it uh, and they you know shimmy that bucket so that it's basically flat to the top of that that bucket and we have a pumping video here that uh, I'd like to do so next to give you guys an idea of that pumping process 
of gypsum. So, Angela, if you can run that video, that would be great. Okay, so that should give you an idea of um, you know the pumping of the thick pore gypsum. Now we did talk about a couple of variables that have to be taken into account: uh, the sand, the gradation of sand, um, the moisture in the sand. You know, and it's it's up to the contractor to ensure that uh, you know the amount of water that's being mixed uh, in with the product is delivering the material uh, that should have the the flow and heel of uh, the gypsum manufacturer's recommendations. Um, there are ways to take variables out of the equation. Um, this is, is one option. You know, a ready mix plant could actually, uh, you know, take the gypsum, take the sand, um, you know, weigh that to specification along with the water and blend that and put it into a truck. Um, you know, it'd have to be close to the job because you got, uh, you know, material in that truck that's going to be setting soon. Um, needless to say that this is you know, not uh, commonly done you know, whatsoever in the industry, uh, just not a common application. You know, another possibility out there to take variables out of the equation is that um, we can blend the sand and the gypsum together and they can be uh, put into a silo on the project uh, to where uh, we have the, you know, the right amount of um, the, the, the right grade of sand um, you know, dryness of sand, uh, the right amount of sand to gyp ratio, and it's a matter of uh, that silo dispensing uh, the sand and the, the gypsum into the pump hopper uh, at the correct weight, and then adding the correct amount of water. So, I mean, that's a that's a that's an option out there, but uh, again, that's not one that's done you know very often. Um, one that is done a little bit more frequently is is with the the newer grades of, of equipment out there for for thick pore gypsum pumping. This is a you know highly engineered pump um, for pumping thick pore gypsum. Uh, you can see uh, a super sack uh, of what is gypsum on the left part of the pump, and it's being dropped into a, a hopper that will house the the gypsum powder. And on the opposite side of that pump, uh, you'll see another hopper where the sand is placed. Uh, into that hopper. Um, it could be super sacks of, uh, of sand that are placed in that hopper as well. And that pump will actually uh, screw feed and convey the, you know, the gypsum and the, the, the sand uh, into a hopper uh, where it's weighed to get the precise weight. And then the water is actually metered to get the, the correct water gypsum uh, sand cement ratio um, to take those variables out of the equation. Um, you know, the, these types of pumps work, uh, you know, very well, but it is a pretty hefty piece of equipment from a dollar standpoint, probably a quarter of a million dollar piece of equipment, something like that. Um, looking at the ratios here, you know, I mentioned this earlier, it's, it's very common that, uh, that it's a four to one ratio out there where you do 480, pack, 480 pound bags of gypsum. Uh, to one bobcat bucket of sand. Uh, once again, as I said earlier, that, that bucket is calibrated. Um, 
you know, so you can control the amount of sand, uh, you know, with that Bobcat uh, front end loader. Um, you know, the thing to be careful with is the amount of sand, you know, certainly adding additional sand, you know, would make it more cost effective, um, you know, and it, it may work well for the contractor, but, you know, additional sand in the product uh, actually, you know, lowers the strength of uh, the overall finished product and actually creates more surface area that uh, would require a little bit more water in the mix to have the flow. So, you know, add more water to the mix too is, a, is can be a detriment to the the final product as well, you know. So it's very critical that you know we have we have the uh, the c controlled bag of gypsum, you know, using the right amount of sand, the right volume of sand, you know, and the right amount of water when pumping. On to another polling question here. So what is the minimum thickness of thick pour gypsum underlayments? Angelie, I, I take it that that polling question was released? Yes, I sent it out. Okay. If anyone's not seeing the poll or not seeing the slides update, go ahead and refresh your screen. Maybe I just put everybody to sleep. <laughs> it might not, the slides might not be updating for some. Folks, is there what it looks go. like. They're starting to come in now. All right, I think we're going to move on from this polling question, but uh, of those have answered, everybody answered three quarters of an inch. Um, and that is the correct answer. Uh, so very common for thick pour gypsums, uh, minimum three quarters of an inch, you know, kind of similar to standard concrete in the, in the regard that uh, you can't just pour concrete at, you know, a feathered edge or, or, or a half inch or an inch. You know, it has to have mass to perform. And it's similar with the thick pour gypsum. You know, we need that mass for it, the uh, massive product for it to perform. So, um, you know, three quarters of an inch is the minimum. Uh, very commonly poured, uh, you know, an inch, inch and a half, or even more to, to create a flat surface. So, something that's commonly done, not with just with not just with thick pour gypsum, but with uh, leveling products in general, to uh, to help uh, understand that we have the right uh, water cement ratio anyhow, is uh, flow diameter tests. Uh, in some cases, they're called slump tests. But um, in essence, this is conducted right on site, uh, you know, as we get the correct mix um, of the material and you got material coming out of the hose that we feel is the right water cement ratio. We have a piece of plexiglass uh, with a, uh, a tube on top of it. And um, we fill that up to the top, you know, lift that off and allow the, the material to flow out. And quite simply with that volume of product, it should flow out with the right amount of water to a certain diameter. And that's, uh, and that's a field test that's done very commonly, not only with thick pour gypsum, but, but self-leveling underlayments uh, in general, uh, called a flow diameter test or a, or a slump test to ensure we got the right water cement ratio. So let's take a look at uh, curing and drying. 
Uh, curing uh, or hydration, that's the chemical reaction between the gypsum and the water in the mix, and that's what enables this material to develop strength and get hard. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, water of convenience in there that allows the product to be flowable, and that water um, does not all get hydrated. Uh, there's some of it that has to evaporate out, and it takes time to do so with thick pore gypsum. Uh, maybe you've heard that it's, you know, a week plus for a thick pore gypsum to, to dry. Um, it's very common. Um, you know, one of the things that's that, that's known out there is a uh, common statement is an, an eighth inch per day from a drying standpoint. So, you know, if you poured it an inch thick, it's uh, roughly, you know, uh, eight days for it to be dry enough to install flooring on it. But the reality is here is the site conditions are going to uh, control how fast or how slow it dries. Um, you know, you're, you know, that's to do with temperature, um, humidity and airflow, you know, though you have a warm environment and, and, uh, low humidity and good airflow, things are going to dry. Anything's going to dry very, very quickly. Um, whereas if you have cooler temperatures, high humidity, um, no airflow, things are going to take longer to dry. Um, but ultimately, um, the thick board gypsum needs to be tested, um, in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations to ensure that it's dry enough to install flooring. So once the, the thick pore gypsum has been deemed dry and ready for flooring, um, it must be primed. It's very common for the manufacturers out there to recommend priming. Uh, the surface is absorbent uh, and has a little bit of a chalky feel to it. Uh, so it's very common to use a, a low solids acrylic or a low solids uh, latex primer. Uh, that gets rolled on the floor, sometimes broomed on the floor. Um, and, and what this does is um, it, it's, 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 it, it'll give the, the adhesive that's going to be spread sufficient open time. Um, the, the, the gypsum is, is very absorbent, uh, has a little bit of a chalky feel, um, and it can, it's, it's very absorbent, so it can suck the life out of a flooring adhesive. So uh, low solids acrylic uh, or latex primers are applied, uh, so the, the adhesive has sufficient open time so that the, the gypsum does not uh, steal the moisture from the adhesive too quickly. Um, and it's very common that the, the GC um, or even the flooring contractor prime that floor um, you know, prior to the installation of the flooring. But, but ultimately, you know, it goes back to the adhesive and the floor covering. And, and in many cases, the, the manufacturer may have their own primer to install on a gypsum floor prior to installing the uh, adhesive in the floor covering. Let's take a look at some physical properties here. So that four to one mix that I referenced earlier, you know, four 80 pound bags with uh, a bobcat scoop of sand and the right amount of water uh, might yield a compressor strength of about 2000 PSI. Uh, you know, as we talked about earlier, um, you know, if we add more sand to the mix, you know, it certainly might make it more cost effective, but additional sand uh, can lower the strength, uh, may require additional water to make it flowable, and can also lower the strength. But um, depending on the manufacturer, there's different products out there. There might be products that are designed for 2,000 PSI, maybe 2,500, maybe 3,500, maybe 4,500. So it all depends on the, the product um, you know, that's being used for the application. The one thing I wanted to make you aware of as uh, is an industry standard for thick pore gypsum to receive resilient floor covering. And that ASTM standard is F2419. And in that standard, it'll detail that uh, wooden subfloors that uh, are gonna receive thick pore gypsum, um, it must have, the thick pore gypsum must have a minimum compressive strength of 2000 PSI. And that standard will also detail that a concrete substrate to receive the thick pore gypsum, that's receiving the thick pore gypsum, um, that thick pore gypsum should have a, a minimum compressive strength of 3,000 PSI. Another polling question. I'm sure you guys are getting sick of the polling questions here, but I believe this is the last one. And that polling question is, uh, what is the ASTM standard for determining absorbency of substrates to receive resilient flooring? And I threw these polling questions in here. Um, you know, for the most part, um, it's something that you know might be a key takeaway of this presentation. 
Um, yes, I threw one in there with a little bit of trivia about gypsum being in uh, Portland cement, but the, the idea behind these is to see what you know and, you know, and, uh, you know, give you some, uh, you know, key points to remember going forward. So we'll give it a few more seconds here as everybody's voting. All right, looks like we might be there. We got uh, 22% uh, said 2479 as well as F710. But the majority uh, said uh, ASTM F3091. And uh, that is the correct uh, standard. ASTM F3091, um, newly developed standard. I say newly, probably in the past couple of years. But this is a standard for uh, testing absorbency of substrates. And as I said earlier here, just a few minutes ago, the, the gypsum material, uh, thick pore gypsum needs to be primed prior to floor covering. And this is a quick, easy test that you can do out in the field to determine whether there's a primer there or not. Uh, just a water absorbency test. So in the, in the top picture, uh, there's no primer on the gypsum and you, you put a bead of water on that in accordance with the standard and it soaks right in immediately. Whereas uh, you look in the bottom picture, uh, that prime surface has a little bit of a gloss to it. It's reflecting light a little bit. Uh, once you put water on it as well, it uh, remains, uh, you know, a bead. You don't see it just immediately soak in, creating a dark spot, and the water's gone. Um, and that designates uh, that there's uh, some sort of sealer there. Um, and the one point that I want to make um, about uh, sealed gypsum um, that I didn't make earlier, uh, the, the sealers are low solids acrylic or low solids latex. And it, it does create a seal there, but it does not create a non-porous surface. You know, water can still uh, penetrate that sealer. Um, it, it's still considered an absorbent substrate, so the moisture and the adhesive can go through that primer and absorb into the gypsum. So it's not considered a, or not classified as a non-porous substrate. But as always, you know, check with your manufacturers. Um, I can't speak for everything out there. You know, check with the gypsum manufacturer, the primer manufacturer, the flooring and adhesive manufacturer for confirmation. So let's move on to things to look for. Okay, surface integrity, you know, that, that's critical. Um, you know, if you go onto a site, you can take a screwdriver and just, you know, drive it right through the material. You know, something's not right there. Um, you know, when mixed correctly, these products have, you know, they have integrity. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, 2,000 PSI compressive, in some cases, 3,000 or even 4,000 compressive strength. They have integrity. You know, driving a screwdriver into it just like that, you know, that, that raises a red flag. You know, if you're taking your fingernail and just easily gouging it or, you know, you've got, uh, you know, dust all over the surface like that, you know, raise the red flag, Okay. You know, get a hold of the manufacturer out, you know, out there and have them take a look at it and, you know, provide recommendations. You know, raise that red flag if something doesn't look right. You know, is it dusty? Is it weak? Okay, can you take a, a coin and just easily gouge into it, uh, you know, a quarter inch with no effort? You know, that raises a red flag. Uh, you see that in the bottom picture. Uh, in the top picture, if you can get underneath the sealer and just peel the sealer right off and, you know, we have, you know, white adhered to the back of the, that sealer or that primer that was used. You know, that throws up a red flag, okay? You know, look for these types of things from a surface integrity standpoint. If you see something that doesn't look right, then, you know, raise the red flag. Have the manufacturer come out and take a look at it and evaluate it and provide a recommendation going forward. One of the big concerns uh, is drying, okay? We already established that you know, very commonly it's an eighth inch per day drying. So obviously an inch thick, you know, and that's roughly an eighth, eight, or roughly eight days of drying. But as I said earlier, that depends on temperature, humidity, and airflow. You know, warm temperatures, low humidity, uh, good airflow, things dry quickly. Uh, cooler temperatures, high humidity, uh, lack of airflow, and things take longer to dry, okay? The big problem in construction here is, is the GC closing up the building after pouring. There's a lot of water convenience in the gypsum that has to evaporate out and closing up the building like that can, can virtually create a, 
uh, a greenhouse effect going on in there where we end up reaching 100 percent humidity in the air and then then you're raining inside that building so you know it's critical to not close it up to have good air good drying to um, drying conditions for that uh, thick pore gypsum to dry out and as i said earlier um, it's also you know once it is deemed dry you know it's critical to um, to test uh, in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations. There's, there's meters out there that have gypsum settings to, to confirm dryness. Some manufacturers may recommend mat testing in, in accordance with ASTM D4263, but, but check with the manufacturer. Uh, and, and from my comedy standpoint, you know, we're really going to take a torch and try to get things to dry out. Come on. You know, we all know better than that. Maybe you've gone on to a renovation where you've torn up floor covering, um, and, you know, and the gypsum does not have good integrity there. You know, maybe maybe it wasn't mixed correctly. Maybe it was used in an application that 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 um, was outside of its recommendations, and you know, you're you're left with a floor that is horrible. Uh, it, it may require taking it all out and you know starting all over again. Very possible. Okay. One of the biggest issues we see out there with the gypsum is, and with leveling products in, in general, self-leveling in general, is overwatering. Okay, the bottom line here with thick pore gypsum or, or or leveling products in general, it's the right amount of water with the with the, the sand and cement mixture uh, to keep everything in suspension. You know, everything has to be in suspension, top, middle, or bottom. You know, what we've seen on this, um, you know, this one is complete face separation where the Sand and the cement has fallen out of some out of suspension. You can see all the sand particles at the bottom of the pore, and you have nothing but fines up at the top. And what what you know raised the red flag on this project was the lack of integrity of this material. I mean, easily gouged with no effort at all. You know, using your fingertip, and it's just it's just overwatering. It's simple as that. Everything falls out of the suspension. Heavy materials go to the bottom. The light materials go to the top, and you're left with a very weak dusty surface. Um, one of the things that can be done out there um, is, a, is a matte bond test, a flooring matte bond test. And this is also a newly developed standard within the past year or so, ASTM F3311. This is basically uh, adhering your floor covering to a substrate, uh, allowing it to sit for uh, 72 hours and then doing a pull test on it. And that certainly can be done with any patching or leveling products, and it certainly can be done with thick pore gypsum. And it's a matter of um, evaluating that pull test. You know, how difficult was it to remove? You know, did it take some effort to, to, to remove it or did it peel right off with no effort? Uh, and then where was the mode of failure? Okay, those are the two things that you're looking at here. Now, I realize, you know, there's no way to really quantify um, the difficulty in removing um, but, I mean, if something is, pe if the floor covering is easily peeled out with no effort, um, you know, something isn't right. And then it's a matter of looking where that mode of failure is. And in this one here, um, you know, the gypsum was, uh, it, it was overwatered. We had a weak, dusty surface. Uh, floor covering was adhered, vinyl plank. And upon removal, you know, we peeled, uh, you know, the surface off of the, the gypsum. So it was a matter of mechanically cleaning down to solid material and then patching and leveling and then following following uh, that, the installation of finished floor covering. Now, on the other side of things, you know, here's a, an app, uh, application um, over a, a thick pore gypsum floor that, uh, you know, passed the matte bond test. Um, it was very difficult to remove this. You know, it was well bonded. Uh, primarily, the, the failure was uh, cohesive within the adhesive. Uh, you did see a little bit of uh, uh, cohesive failure within the gypsum, but the primary failure was uh, in the adhesive, which is, you know, where we'd expect it to be for an acrylic or, you know, latex flooring or latex adhesive. Uh, so, you know, doing the matte bond test and uh, evaluating that um, is something that can be done out in the field as well. Now, when it's all said and done, you know, maybe there's patching or leveling that may need, may to, be, uh, may need to take place. Um, uh, prior to installation of flooring, and there are engineered gypsum, plaster, and uh, Portland cement self-leveling underlayments out there on the market that are specifically designed for um, smoothing thick pore gypsum. Uh, they're very commonly uh, low-tension materials uh, because um, 
you know, they're, they're being a high strength material. They're going over a, a product that has uh, very commonly a lower strength value. So they, they're, they're low tension by design uh, for that reason, but uh, very high, high strength uh, from a developed standpoint. And it, it's basically providing a new surface uh, for the finished flooring. And that's very commonly done. It may be a quarter inch, maybe an eighth inch application over a thick pour gypsum uh, renovation project. Um, there are skim coating uh, options out there for skim coating uh, thick pour gypsum, uh, whether it's new construction or renovation. But um, uh, one thing to keep in mind here, if it's a renovation and uh, we're concerned about um, the overall integrity of the, the gypsum, um, you know, certainly the skim coat material is being installed very thin, so it's it's low tension just by default uh, because it's a thin application. But, you know, that thin application, that skim coating of that gypsum, uh, we don't have any real mass of material there. And it's only providing a surface uh, to adhere new flooring for. Okay. Um, putting a thin skim coat down uh, doesn't change the fact uh, that you have a, maybe a questionable substrate underneath. Um, you know, if you're concerned about the integrity of the gypsum in this renovation application, it would make sense to do a leveling product at a at a uh, eighth inch or quarter inch to, to provide a new shell over top. If we just do a skim coat over a, a, a thick pour gypsum that um, may not have the strength requirements uh, that's necessary for the application, that that skim coat doesn't change anything. So if we're concerned about you know point loads, uh, that thin skim coat is not going to change that. If we're concerned about rolling load indentation or, or rutting, that, that thin skim coat is not going to change that either. So we have to understand, you know, what we have at hand and what's going to be installed going forward to include the flooring, as well as what type of traffic uh, in this application. Um, you know, the thick pour gypsum might have been totally suitable for the type of use that it was once uh, this, this area was designed for initially, but uh, in the new application, it, uh, it may not be suitable. So we've got to look at the whole picture. Um, it's very common, whether you're patching or leveling over existing gypsum, that um, we use a primer that actually um, provides an isolation layer between the two materials. So, you know, a couple of things that are happening here with the primer that you're, you're priming existing gypsum. Uh, number one, it helps consolidate the surface of the existing gypsum. Um, you know, as I told you earlier, you know, gypsum is very porous. So, you know, the primer is uh, uh, sealing that surface and consolidating that surface so that the gypsum doesn't rob mixed water from the, the patching or leveling material or the patch or I'm sorry, the leveling or smoothing material or the patching material. And it, it also provides an isolation layer. Um, you know, if we have a Portland cement product that's going over a gypsum cement product, there, there can be an adverse reaction between the Portland cement and the gypsum cement. Uh, so you'll see a double priming as a, as a recommendation to create like an isolation layer between the Portland cement product and the gypsum cement product. Um, if you have that adverse reaction, um, it can create an expansive effect when the chemistry, the adverse chemistry is happening, um, that adverse um, expansion that happens can create disbonding. And that process um, that, that results um, in this expansion is, is called etringite. Uh, maybe you've heard that, um, heard that before. Um, but when we're using Portland cement and, and uh, gypsum cement, uh, that isolation area uh, layer, uh, that priming area is critical so that we don't have an uh, adverse effect between the gypsum and the, and the Portland. Uh, we've seen this on rare occasion with Portland cement concrete. If they happen to put a little bit too much gypsum in there um, as a set regulator, on very rare occasion, we've had etringite happen in, in, in Portland cement concrete uh, just because there was a little too much gypsum in that Portland cement. Uh, but doesn't happen very common at all. The bottom line here um, is to be thorough with your evaluation. You know, we've learned a lot about, uh, you know, the, the uh, gypsum um, to include, you know, the mixing and application of it. 
And, uh, you know, go through your evaluation uh, process prior to installing flooring. You know, if you see something that doesn't quite look right, whether, whether it's a thick pour gypsum or, or any patching or leveling material out there, you know, raise the red flag and bring the manufacturers in and uh, everybody can be on the same page with the process going forward so that uh, the project is successful. Okay, simple as that. Raise that red flag and uh, go from there. At this point, I will turn it uh, over to everyone uh, for any questions that uh, anybody may have. Thank you so much, Seth. If the audience has any questions or comments, please submit them in the question box to the left of your screen. We'll wait a, we'll wait a moment for people to enter in their questions. Actually, uh, Seth, we have a question from John. Seth, are super plasticizers sometimes used to strengthen and help quicken the drying traits? when added uh, uh, added when site mixed? Um, super plasticizers are, are commonly added to concrete uh, to actually reduce the amount of water in concrete and uh, make the concrete more plastic. So we can use less wa water in the concrete and make the concrete more flowable or more workable, if you will. And it ultimately increases the strength um, it's possible that these types of materials, um, you know, may be added um, on, on site. Um, I would consult with the, with the uh, thick pour gypsum manufacturer to see what their recommendations are. That might be a possibility. Um, I know from our standpoint, uh, we have, you know, engineered gypsums uh, products that are pre-bagged. So, you know, the sand and the cement and the polymers all in there. Um, to where you only have to, you know, uh, add the correct amount of water. But some of the thick pour gypsum materials out there where you have bagged gypsum and we're adding sand on site, it's possible that there might be um, additives, um, you know, whether they're super plasticizers or, or acrylics or latex mixtures, they're, 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 that might be a possibility, I would say, consult with the, uh, the thick pour gypsum manufacturers. Okay, we have another question. If you are doing a rehab of gypsum floor, you still have to maintain the existing UL assembly and use a UL approved product? Yeah, so if, if the existing gypsum in a renovation is in, in uh, good shape and it just needs maybe smoothed or maybe patched prior to new flooring, um, then that assembly would would um, would remain in place from a, a fire rating standpoint, um, and any patch or leveling product used on top, as long um, as it's a product that doesn't you know burn or contribute to smoke um, or flame or fuel, it's not going to take away from that assembly. However, if the existing gypsum uh, during the removal process is is damaged and replacement of the, the gypsum is required prior to new flooring, then it is critical that, that a, a gypsum product um, or, or other product is, is used um, that has been tested by UL um, and the thickness of that product with that entire assembly uh, would, um, would maintain that, that fire rated if it was a one hour assembly. So, uh, Hopefully I said that okay. I'll try again here uh, just to make sure. Um, the existing gypsum is removed for whatever reason. Uh, if we want to maintain that assembly, then we have to put back a product um, with that complete assembly that has been tested by UL so that we maintain whatever assembly was there with the thick pour gypsum. Hopefully that's a little bit clearer. We have another question, Seth. Okay. Even with a primer, you even with a primer used before applying gypsum over concrete, and the concrete has some moisture movement, is the likelihood of an etrignite et et reaction, et reaction increased? Yeah. So it no. It, it basically. 
we have to have uh, gypsum. Um, the chemical reaction of gypsum, you know, and the chemical reaction of Portland cement. So it's really the the chemistry of the Portland cement that is interfa interfacing with the gypsum that causes entrangite. If we have cured concrete and we're putting a primer down and, and putting a gypsum, thick pour gypsum down or a gypsum underlay layment, there is not that concern. But on the reverse side, if we have gypsum down, the, even though the gypsum's cured and we're installing a patch or leveling product that will have Portland cement chemistry in it, uh, it is critical that there's a primer that, that keeps uh, the interface of those two materials separate uh, to take that risk of adverse reaction creating etringite. So hopefully that answer clarifies things. Okay. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, it doesn't appear that there are any additional questions that have come through. So um, if there aren't any more questions, uh, Seth, you wanted to make a final announcement about people contacting you? Yeah, absolutely. Now, number one, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to spend some time with uh, us today and talking about thick pour uh, gypsum underlayment. And as I see it, I have think pour, so I apologize for the misspelling there. Hopefully uh, it wasn't like that than the rest of the slides that I didn't pick up on. But um, thank you for your time today. And uh, you can certainly reach out to me uh, afterwards uh, through FCICA, or you can reach out to me directly at seth.pavarnik uh, at artxamericas.com. So I thank you for your time today. And uh, if we can help out in any way going further, don't hesitate to holler. Great. Thank you so much, Seth, since, there's no, um, th since there aren't any more questions. Then on behalf of FCICA, thank you, Seth, for presenting today's webinar. SIMS may now navigate to the Submit Credit tab to receive credit. Please note that you must be signed into the educational platform for this feature to work. If you have any issues, please let us know. This is the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.